Hello, class. Today we will speak of a faction of elves who may be some of the cruelest beings in this world. A cruelty not born through the grand design of a dark god, but born of a belief that such evil acts are in service to a greater good. Today, class, we will speak of the Twilight Kin. One could say that the birth of the Twilight Kin as a people began at the start of the God War, when the Council of Heaven, a council composed of the greatest elven wizards of the time, traveled with the Celestian Oscon through the Void, the infinite space between worlds. Their aim, the homeworld of the Celestians, lost centuries before. It was during this journey that the Fanulian Mirror was shattered, and history would take a dark turn. The breaking of this mirror had a catastrophic effect on this world, for it was no simple magical device. It was a magical artifact. Uskan had convinced the great elven wizard Fanulian to craft, making the love-struck elf believe it would finally woo the love of his life to his side. In truth, its design hit its true purpose. As a scrying star that would lead Uskan to the celestial homeworld, a construction that Fanulian, the only mage capable of creating it, had refused to craft. As the dangers of the Void made such an action inadvisable, when the mirror shattered, it split the Celestians into the Shining and Wicked Ones, and started the God War that would last for generations on our world, while in the Void, its effects were far more immediate, as the path the Elves and Uskan were using across the Void broke apart beneath their feet. Although Uskan was able to escape the destruction of the path, the Elven Wizards were not so lucky. They were blasted with the energies of that merciless realm, before their bodies were disgorged back to their home, the city of Lurleth, known then as the greatest institution of magical learning in all of Panathor. Although the elves were dead, that didn't seem to matter to the bodies they left behind. The corpses became bloated masses of flesh, that ever expanded within the chamber they had once used to explore worlds, until finally, they burst the expelled energies destroying the city and surrounding countryside for hundreds of miles. Not all who called that city home died, however. Many were in other parts of Panathor on their own business, but once they heard of the destruction of their homeland, many rushed back. Those elves crossed a blasted landscape, and in their horror, saw what little was left of their home. Where the city once stood, there was a massive crater, which would later be called the Mouth of Leth, or by other races further in time, the Pit of Despair. The elves that remained grew despondent, and not even the attempts of their fellow elves from other nations could raise their spirits. Their home, one of the greatest cities in Panathor, was gone, and all they could do was live in the outskirts of the crater where it once stood. And for years, this despondent state remained, until one elven thaumaturge heard a whisper in the wind. Her original name is now long forgotten, changed on that day to reflect her new purpose and position, becoming known as Lethendir, the Dark Prophetess. Now for those who don't know, Thaumaturgy is a magical discipline that although not outright banned during this time, was considered a dangerous magical art. It was an art that could transform flesh, fold space, and see magic beyond the physical sphere. But it also affected the mind, turning the usually haughty and proud elves into somber and brooding shadows of their former selves, a state of mind that had many calling these practitioners twilight kin, those stuck between the darkness and the light, and it was one of these thaumaturges, Lethendir, that heard something from the depths of the crater, a whisper compelling her to travel within. As she began to walk down, others noticed her purposeful movements. Many chose to follow, as if her focused strength gave them a purpose they had been craving for so long. Soon it became a pilgrimage, as all the elves on the surface followed her into the depths of the earth. They traveled through fissures, crevices, and into deep channels carved by a nation of dwarves long forgotten by history, and in its very depths, where the remnants of their former home was lodged deep within, they discovered the massive gemstone known as the Silver Sanctum. The Silver Sanctum was, as you can guess, no ordinary gemstone. It was actually created centuries before, when the Celestians began traveling from their homeworld to our world of Panathor. Three times the Celestians had crossed over with great success, but on the fourth attempt, tragedy struck. 
A massive void explosion rocked the path between worlds, destroying it. And what emerged from the portal was a being born of a former Celestian and a creature of the Void, an entity that would come to be known as the Void Spawn. The Wizards and Celestians could not destroy this beast, but they could contain it, thrusting it into the gemstone where its powers were nullified, and there it stayed, until the destruction of the city, the explosion weakening its bindings just enough to whisper to a mind sensitive to its calling. All the elves that saw the Silver Sanctum were fascinated by it, but none more so than Lethendir. For forty days she tranced before it, not stirring while her fellow elves watched over her, until the forty-first day, when her eyes finally opened and revealed themselves to be glowing with a strange and eerie light. Lethendir revealed that the creature within the sanctum was utterly alien, and her trance was her mind simply trying to decipher meaning from a chaotic maelstrom of impressions the creature tried to convey. But eventually, through her probing, she discovered a purpose for her people. She led them across the chasms of the mouth of Leth to a massive pillar in its very center, and through the magic of the thaumaturges, ramps were created to reach its peak. What they saw as they climbed was impossible. Pieces of buildings of obvious elven make held in mid-air, but not as a random mixture of blasted floating ruins, more as completed buildings, with pieces simply missing, as if the void in between held them in place, as surely as any solid construction. And at the pillar's peak, Lethendir revealed the truth to her people, that their grand city and their loved ones weren't destroyed. The explosion has simply shunted them all to another realm, if those pieces of their former city could be recovered, and their people saved, they could restore their home once again. In other words, what was destroyed by accident could be restored with intention. For the first time in a long time, the remaining elves of the city of Luraleth had a purpose. A purpose that became known as a Great Return. As the God War wrecked havoc across Panathor, the Twilight Kin worked deep within the mouth of Leth, exploring more of its depths and claiming it as their own, while their dark mages perused whatever tomes they had on the nature of the Void. However, their knowledge was limited. In desperation, the twenty wises of the Thaumaturges tried to commune with the Void Spawn, an attempt that was rather unsuccessful. The lucky ones simply went mad. The unlucky turned into mutant abominations that had to be put down to prevent more of her people from being sacrificed. Lethendir chose to open her mind to the Void Spawn once again. She did not return for several days, but when she did, she was changed, her body becoming a patchwork of elven and mutant flesh. However, despite the dark, scabby skin along the right side of her body and peculiar growth sprouting from her scalp, her mind was still her own, still as strong as it was when she first communed with the creature within. She told them more of the Void Spawn and the realm it came from, a void between dimensions that was full of monsters, but also contained the precious pieces of their broken home. Of course, traveling the mind-altering depths of the void and getting to those pieces would require something they didn't have, knowledge. And to get that knowledge, they would need to take it from the libraries of their fellow elves and other nations. From their number were chosen those with skills in spycraft, espionage, and infiltration. These would form the Drenarchi, or the Lurkers of Leth as many other races have come to call them. These Drenarchi infiltrated elven society across Panathor, by day acting as upstanding elves, but by night sneaking into libraries and private collections to steal any bits of knowledge they can on the nature of the Void. A task has gone unnoticed for months, until an unlucky aide discovered a team of Drenarchi mid-theft. The Drenarchi murdered the aide and fled the scene leaving behind a mystery the elves of that nation were keen to solve. An investigation was had, and the theft of the books was discovered. Suspected to be the work of the Wicked Ones, a call was made to root out those who were responsible. Leading this hunt was Mikael Feywill, a young captain eager to prove his worth, and with a zeal that brought him quite a bit of success. Although not when it came to the Twilight Kin, his son actually rooted out many Wicked One cults, but any proof of the Twilight Kin's involvement, or even existence, was not found, for Lethendir wisely ordered her people into hiding. For now, the tomes they had found would have to be enough. Although much knowledge was gathered, parsing that knowledge was almost impossible. Rooting out the bits of truth in millennia of legends and mad ravings would take a lifetime, so Lethendir once again risked herself to commune with the Void Spawn, communing with it for so long that she had to be dragged away from it by her kin. 
for fear of losing her completely. Not an easy task, as she was further mutated by the presence of the void spawn. Grown to the size of an ogre, with horrible tentacles bursting from her form. But as before, her mind was still strong, if not stronger. Her will allowing her to rip information from the mind of the void spawn, despite its attempts to resist. With her probing, she discovered that her people could not simply create safe paths through the void like the elven wizards of their former home. They must sail this infinite ocean to find the pieces they seek. And to sail it, they needed ships that could survive such a journey. Thankfully, a substance that could safely do so was right beneath their feet. In the underground caverns, Evershrooms grew, a fungi with stalks as tough as oak, and whose unique biology could withstand the merciless tides of the void. From the fungi were crafted ships that glowed a sickly green in the dark, but in the light of the sun, a deep black, as if sucking in all the light around it. There are many variants of these night ships. One that is commonly seen when the twilight can engage with other forces is the void skiff. The magic of the thaumaturges allowing to sail on land as easily as it sails through water. The largest of these variants, those that lead their fellows across the void between worlds, have one addition that is both necessary and horrifying. A living figurehead. In the same way that fear allows for the walls between the void and Panathor to thin, blood can be used to navigate it. An elf is chosen and taken to what is known as the Blood Shrine. There, they willingly allow thaumaturges to carve mystic sigils into their bare flesh. Once done, they are then placed into the prow fibber, their blood acting as an anchor between the ship and the world of Panathor, ensuring that the Twilight King can find their way home, no matter where they are in the void. Of course, using this blood to safely travel the tides of the void is no easy feat. Thankfully, it was learned that those who had strong blood ties to the sacrifice could navigate the tides the easiest. Specifically, the Mothers of the Living Anchor. The Anchor's mother acting as a navigator for their fleet, while soothing the soul of their child. Their boats crafted and their living anchors prepared, the ships of the Twilight can travel the vast network of underground waterways within the mouth of Leth, to one of the many places where the walls between the world and the void were thin, and travel through into a realm of the impossible. The true nature of the void is beyond mortal comprehension, a place where time and space is fluid, and many of the rules of the physical world can be bent if not outright broken, and it is a realm that does not go easy on a mortal body, traveling it eventually causing mutations. Strangely though, it was discovered that female elves are far more resistant to the effects of the void than males, which is why a vast majority of those elves crewing those void fleets are female. This isn't because male elves fear the void and avoid service, both genders join the fleet equally, since being part of it is seen as a great honor. It's just that the males tend to have a higher attrition rate. Whatever their sex, those elves who travel the void have their skin gain a deep purplish hue, and their hair fades to a colorless cobweb like mass, while their eyes start to glow slightly with the unnatural light of the void. Most of these elven corsairs that crew these ships of the Vridnakir, or void walkers in the non elven tongues masters of various forms of weapons, and a few of these void walkers take on the role of fleet wardens, those corsairs tasked with defending their ship from the monstrosities that inhabit the void, and commanding them are the void captains. As you can guess, they are the master of a particular ship, or even a fleet, and are highly respected, seen as only beneath the dark conclave, the ruling thaumaturges of Leth, in terms of authority. As these elves traveled, they began to find objects from their lost home, pieces of their city free-floating in the void, powerful relics that were owned by the most wise and mages of their age, and other objects tied to Loraleth. But on occasion, they found living relics, elves who somehow survived in the void since the destruction of the city. Most of these elves were stark raving mad, their long time in the void having an ill effect on their sanity. What the Twilight can do to these elves, I'm not sure. I assume they keep them somewhere they won't cause harm to themselves or others, or perhaps they found some use for them. A few of these found elves, however, when they crossed the barrier to our world, proved to be not truly elves, but monstrous beings in elven skin. You see, class, although there are dangerous physical entities in the void, there are also entities that are invisible and intangible, devoid of form, they pluck shapes for themselves from the minds of living people they encounter, stealing memories to fool the crew, or simply torment them. 
most of these entities aren't particularly intelligent and tend to pounce on the first physical thing they can sense, whether that thing is living or not, meaning that part of a ship, or even the armor and weapons of a warrior, can be infested with one of these creatures. The Twilight King quickly learned that these objects took on strange properties when possessed by these creatures. Figureheads and carvings became almost alive. Armor, although occasionally fusing with the wearer, gained a strange vitality that would strengthen or even heal their elf, and weapons would gain a natural edge and aid its elven wielder strikes. Formerly living objects seemed most likely to grab a void creature's attention, and soon the king would don armor and weapons made of flayed hides and bone, hoping to attract the attention of these creatures, forming armor and weapons far more powerful than anything crafted by terrestrial metals. Still, despite the benefits, the entities came in numbers that hindered the Twilight Kin's progress and safety, until it was learned that a majority of these creatures could be diverted. Like predators in the physical world, they tend to seek easy prey. If the elves left a trail of cages behind their craft, each with a poor living being within it, the creatures would go for them instead. Of course, such victims would not come from the Twilight Kin. It would be others who would be sacrificed for the Twilight Kin's great return. Perhaps due to the method they used to enter the void, the Twilight Kin seem to be able to exit the void anywhere on this world where water flows. Reports have had them appear on terrestrial seas, seaside caves, and even lakeside grottos far from any river or ocean. Wherever they return to our world, they attack the nearest settlement, taking as many slaves as will fill their holes, and killing the rest, leaving no survivors. As for those who are enslaved, they are doomed to a life of despair, for these Twilight Kin are far different from those that first followed Lithendir into the mouth of left centuries before. Theirs was now a culture that was the epitome of the ends justifying the means, where any sin, no matter how great, would be forgiven once their glorious city and their people were fully restored. Besides expecting forced labor, or a very short and maddening life within a cage, these victims would also be subject to torture and bloody rituals. This wasn't done by the Twilight Kin just for sick pleasure, although most did seem to enjoy the activity, but to test the resolve of the Twilight Kin. Those that showed any hesitancy were tortured themselves until they were freed of such weakness, or died under the rack. The belief being that those who would balk at such methods obviously did not have the will to do whatever is necessary to complete the Great Return. Soon both the Shining Ones and the Wicked Ones took notice of these raids. The Shining Ones immediately suspected the Wicked Ones, and their search was focused in that direction. But the Wicked Ones, knowing it obviously wasn't them, began to search beyond the Shining Ones' limited point of view, and it was through their investigations that they discovered the Twilight Kin. Upon their discovery, the Abyssal Bill first arranged for the Twilight Kin to be found by the armies of the Shining Ones, leaving evidence that would point the Shining Ones' agents in their direction. Once made aware of them, Mikael, now centuries wiser and a Grand Inquisitor, began a crusade to end these obviously corrupted elves. With a common enemy established, Bale came to the Twilight Kin and offered an alliance, offering the aid of the Wicked Ones in trade for their service in the God War. But first, the Twilight Kin would have to survive the onslaught of their fellow elves. Although many of the Twilight Kin were tempted to fight, Wiser Hez realized they were not strong enough to withstand the full assault of all elven kind, so a plan was put in place. A tenth of their number would fight on the surface, while the rest fled deep into the most hidden places in the mouth of Leth. A bloody conflict followed, with every Twilight Kin above refusing to surrender, and fighting to the last elf. A battle so fierce that the Inquisitors were convinced they had destroyed the Twilight Kin once and for all. With their supposed extermination, the Twilight Kin were free to raid once more, although much more carefully, which resulted in far less ambitious trips into the void, their focus shifting to the terrestrial, with explorations into the hidden places of Panathor, and more dealings with the Wicked Ones, both avenues leading to fruitful discoveries. When it came to serving the Wicked Ones, they did not fight in their armies, but simply served as scouts and spies, a task in which they excelled, and in that service, they learned much from the Wicked Ones of the Art of Terror, the Twilight Kin soon incorporating diabolical designs in their armor and weapons, as well as employing tactics to shake the hearts of those they raid, and those they face in battle. As for their travels on Panathor, one such exploration led to a truly spectacular discovery. In the swamp jungles of Mughal, the Twilight Kin discovered an ancient temple, and within, 
were found tablets with the rituals necessary to harness the dwellers of the Void. Soon a new profession was born from this knowledge, the Void Wrangler, composed of those Twilight Kin who once tamed the Dark Worms and underground caverns beneath the mouth of Lath. They now captured and tamed the creatures of the Void, to use as mounts and beasts of war. One of the most terrifying of these beasts being the monstrous Gordrake, a terrifying creature able to destroy entire companies of warriors with ease. The Twilight Kin also learned to summon and bind the beings known as Night Stalkers into their service. However, although the Twilight Kin had experienced summoning demons due to their alliance with the Wicked Ones, summoning beings from the Void is a far more difficult process. A demon may be a being of pure evil, but at least it's an evil that can be understood by mortal minds. The minds of Night Stalkers are far more alien, and those who summon them, elven females known as Crone Summoners, inevitably go insane, as their connection to these beings slowly corrode their minds. From the tablets, they also learn the art of blood shaping, infusing bodies with the powers of the void, and after many horrible experiments, successfully molded elves into powerful mutant creatures, one prime example being the Impalers, elves locked into Baroque armor, containing obsidian needles that infuse them with void energies. Far less stable mutations have also been seen in their armies, such as mutants and weavers, composed of elves and non-elves, whose minds and bodies have been twisted beyond recognition by exposure to the void. On occasion though, one of these mutants will have enough strength of will to become a soul babe, a stable mutant so malevolent and warped by the void as to be unrecognizable from the individual that birthed the monster they have become. The War with Winter, which occurred quite some time after the God War, was a time of great opportunity for the Twilight Kin, with the other factions distracted dealing with the Wicked One Winter. The Twilight Kin could raid much more freely. However, although the number of slaves were now plentiful, the number of elves who effectively used them was pitifully low. Something about the void energy permeating the mouth of Leth made having children rather difficult. To increase their number and ensure the great return could continue, elves from other parts of Panathor needed to join their ranks. Soon cults were formed all across elven territories, Twilight Kin hidden amongst their masses extolling the virtues of the Great Return, a message that is surprisingly quite effective, as the elves of today are gripped by nostalgia for civilization past, a belief that the greatest accomplishments of their people occurred before the God War and can never be repeated or surpassed. It's one of the reasons many believe elven society has stagnated over the centuries, making the Twilight Kin's promise of a return to this glorious past extremely tempting to most elves. With the Twilight Kin's return, the Inquisition was called once again, and with Mikael at its head, it aimed to wipe out the Twilight Kin once and for all. Aiding them was the Elven King Therensor, who allied with the nation that bordered Twilight Kin territory, the Ophidians, an alliance that was quite effective in rooting out numerous cults and expunging them. In revenge, the Twilight Kin sent Drenarchi to kill the king and kidnap his children, aiming to use them as hostages. However, the Twilight Kin had traitors in their ranks, servants of the Wicked Ones, who planned to sacrifice the children to make a permanent hole in the Abyss. To prevent this from happening, the Twilight Kin chose to reveal the location of the ritual to the Inquisition, and they had the perfect agent to give this message, Mikael's wife. Unknown to him, Mikael's wife was a convert of the Twilight Kin, and for years had been giving them information, but now, she was forced to reveal her allegiances to her husband and he did not take it well. He ordered her in prison and led a charge to the ritual site, facing the Archfiend Amok the Desecrator and his infernal army. A battle that ended with Mikael's victory and the Archfiend trapped within Mikael's black blade. Some time later, the new king's agents came for Mikael's wife. Although he would think some clemency would be given, after warning her husband of the ritual, the new king had no such mercy. He wished to make an example of the Twilight Kin and Mikael knew that his wife would most likely suffer for quite a while before her inevitable death. When his fellow Inquisitors came, he chose to fight, for he still loved his wife and could not see her suffer, fleeing with her as soon as he could. At one point, with his former brethren hot in their heels, Mikael told his wife to flee and chose to hold his ground to give her time, and although she did flee, at first, she returned to be at his side. Despite her betrayal, she still loved her husband and would not see him die for her, a decision that ultimately resulted in her losing her life, dying in Mikael's arms, as the Inquisition finally captured him. 
Despite his many accomplishments, the Inquisition was not merciful. His betrayal hurt them deeply, and they were convinced he was another agent of the Twilight Kin. For why else would he try to defend his traitorous wife? Despite the torture, Mikael did not give an inch, barely uttering a sound. As they performed more and more brutal tortures to break his will, his resistance proof in their eyes of his guilt. However, in a moment of frustration, one of the Inquisitors grew careless, allowing Mikael to kill the Inquisitor, retrieve his black blade, and escape. With his wife dead and his former allies convinced he was a traitor, all Mikael wished for was the embrace of oblivion, but the Dark Conclave realized that such a powerful foe could become a powerful ally. Lethendir herself came before him and explained the Great Return, how they could not only restore the elven glory of old, but through the impossible powers of the Void, return his wife to the living. And like the elves who followed Lethendir into the mouth of Leth, Mikael found himself with a purpose, the former Inquisitor soon becoming known as the Lord of Nightmares one of the greatest champions of the Twilight Kin, and given command of the Blight Shades, the Twilight Kin's secret police. The mission of the Blight Shades is threefold. First is the removal of those elves who would serve the forces of the Abyss. After their betrayal by the Wicked Ones, Lethendir decreed that there would be no more dealings with the forces of the Abyss, and the summoning of demons was outlawed. Still, there are those tempted by the Wicked One's powers, and the Blight Shades always keep an eye out for these traitors. Second was the removal of the weak willed. Although the Twilight Kin use the powers of the Void, they see it as a tool and refuse to be influenced by its inhabitants. If an elf is seen as infected by these eldritch beings, they are cut down to prevent this infection from spreading. Finally, the Blight Shades remove those not seen as committed to the Great Return, a hunt that instills feelings of paranoia and distrust amongst the Twilight Kin especially since those who expose such individuals are greatly rewarded, meaning that bonds of friendship or affection are rare amongst these elves, for each one fears exposing a weakness to those that would take advantage. Class, I wish to give you a very important bit of advice. If you ever find yourself at risk of being in the hands of the Twilight Kin, I suggest you end your life. Other factions may be just as cruel, but few are as creative with their tortures, and when they are done with you, they will send your wasted body into the void. And honestly, class, I would rather my soul be sent to the abyss than consumed by the eldritch creatures that exist in the void between worlds. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed this video on the Twilight Kin, evil eldritch elves who do terrible, terrible things, but for a greater good, at least in their minds. If you like this video, please like, subscribe, comment, and press the little bell so the YouTube gods know I exist and hopefully more people see my content. And if you're inclined, yep, yeah, a little bit of cash on you, please consider giving to my Patreon and my Ko-fi account. The extra money gives you a chance to work on these stories I love. Anyway, thanks for listening slash watching and uh, see you next time.